Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Rick Ozzie Nelson. I'm director of the Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Program here at the Center for Strategic International Studies. Um, I thank you all for braving the first day of school and the bad weather and um, this uh, very hectic week that we have in, in, in advance here in front of us. Um, we are absolutely honored and thrilled here to have uh, TSA Administrator John Pistol to speak. Um, as you know, TSA obviously since 9-11 and its creation has been the center and the focal point of a lot of discussions about what the appropriate role is for homeland security, in particular transportation security. Um, we know TSA many times, we relate TSA to only in the visual the American public many times has is just the individual who does the screening at the airport. And unfortunately, that's not all the TSA does. And TSA's portfolio is much broader, much, uh, uh, much more de deeper than, um, than that in itself. Um, and the advances that TSA has made over the years, despite the criticisms and despite the, the, the media sometimes wanting to focus on where they went wrong, the advances in, uh, TSA has made since its inception are actually quite, quite remarkable. Um, one of the things going forward in this 21st century threat that we have we're facing, where we're going to see this increase of transnational threats and these threats that are going to cross our borders and, and, and metastasize themselves inside the United States, is this continued struggle between what the right balance is between privacy and security. And TSA, in many ways, is at the forefront of that debate. Every day, their individual officers who are in the field have to deal with that balance between privacy and security. And it's extremely difficult, and it's only going to get more difficult going forward. When you have an organization with a charter like that, um, who <laughs> you don't get a lot of pats on the back when you do a pat down the right way, right? You don't, nobody says, nice job, TSO, TS, TSA screener. Uh, you only get criticized when, when something goes wrong. To manage an organization, like that, when that's what your charter is, is you don't get a lot of praise when you do it right, but you get a lot of to come down when you do it wrong, requires significant level of leadership and management skill. And that's where Administrator John Pistol comes in and why we're honored to have him here. He's been a lifelong, in government service lifelong, uh, nearly 30 years, most of those 26 at the FBI, that's where he was at 9-11. Uh, he brings a type of leadership, the type of integrity to an organization, um, that, to, to manage an organization like TSA. So for today, I'd like to introduce Administ Administrator uh, uh, Pistol. He's going to come and give about 20 to 30 minutes of remarks, and then we're going to go ahead and go to questions and answers. Um, and again, we uh, appreciate when the microphone comes around to please uh, stand, state your name and your affiliation, and we look forward to, to hearing uh, Administrator uh, Pistol's remarks. Sir, thank you for attending. Thank you. Well, good morning. Thank you, Ozzy, for that uh, introduction. It's um, a pr privilege to be here this morning with CSIS. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to focus on some of the issues that we are dealing with today, but also use this time to reflect, to look back on where we were on 9-11 and where we have come in the past decade, what we're doing today, and then as we look forward to the next 10 years. So that's how my, my comments will be uh, focused this morning. We obviously uh, have had the opportunity, especially in this last week and, and this week as we come up to the 10th anniversary on Sunday, to see a lot of coverage about where people were, what was going on, how lives were changed, how lives were lost. Um, a number of you, I'm sure, watched some of those um, over the weekend. And as we look forward to how we can do the best possible job of making sure that a tragedy such as 9-11 doesn't happen again, we have to be very mindful of where we have come from, and that context, I think, is critically important. So I'd like to, this morning, uh, dedicate these comments to, to the victims uh, of 9-11, um, to the heroes who, uh, knowing the danger that they faced, the hundreds of, of firefighters, law enforcement officers, first responders, uh, particularly went into the, the Trade Center Towers uh, to, to rescue those uh, who were at peril. And uh, I just ask that we just take a moment of, of silence in, in remembrance of them. Thank you. So we talk about uh, the events of 9-11, and it's easy to lose sight of what happened. But as we see some of these uh, memorials, some of the, the tributes and things, um, it brings it all back. And just as it was one of those defining events 
for a certain generation, similar to Pearl Harbor of another generation or the JFK assassination, whatever that defining event has been in, in your generation, uh, it's easy to, to think of what you were doing, where you were, and how you responded to that. And uh, I'm sure that you've had that opportunity. And as you think about uh, this, this coming Sunday and the 10th anniversary, uh, I, I, again, I think the context is important for where we have been, where we're trying to get to. Uh, I was an FBI agent, as Ozzie mentioned, uh, on 9-11. I was assigned to our inspection division out of FBI headquarters, but was actually in New York, New York State, actually in Syracuse, to do an inspection of, of the office there. And I had just uh, completed an outside interview with a, uh, a local media outlet there and had arrived at a local judge's uh, office, his chambers there, to interview him on how that FBI office in Syracuse was, Syracuse was doing. Uh, when I got to the judge's office, the TVs were on, and there was talk and, and coverage of uh, the, the North Tower being, being on flames and people trying to figure out what had happened. Uh, it was shortly thereafter that um, we realized something was, was terribly wrong, and so I excused myself and, and went back to the, the, the FBI office there. And it was there, moments after I arrived there, that uh, I watched, along with, with many of you, either uh, on, on TV, along with, with millions, uh, to see the second plane hit the South Tower there. And just a sense of, uh, of it being surreal, that this can't be happening, and that, uh, but it, yet it was happening. I think the real impact was when the, the first tower uh, collapsed, in the sense that, um, well, two things really came to mind. This changes everything, and what is next? And of course, the what is next part uh, played out uh, over the, the, the next uh, minutes and, uh, as we learned about the, the, uh, the plane hitting the Pentagon and, of course, in Shanksville, the crash there. Um, from an FBI perspective, the question was, what else is out there? Of course, the, the entire U.S. intelligence, the law enforcement community, what can we do immediately uh, to, to stop anything further? Are there just four planes? Are there other attacks that, that are, are planned? and haven't been carried out, and so all those things. Um, and so when we look at what happened there, obviously today's topic is aviation security. We look at uh, the state of aviation security uh, on 9-11, and I've actually seen some commentators wax nostalgically for the days prior to 9-11 when you could walk out to meet your friends or loved ones at, at the gate or, or uh, whatever it may be, and, and, and of course no or very limited lines and things like that. And that was clearly a different era. Uh, if you think to where, what type of security we had then, it was basically a walk-through metal detector to pick up devices, you know, metal items, knives, or guns that were primarily used for hijackings, particularly uh, to, to Cuba, uh, is what uh, the reasons they were initiated um, decades ago. And then uh, the, the basic x-ray for your carry-on bag. So streamlined process. As we know from the, the photograph uh, uh, from the Portland, Maine airport on 9-11 at 545 uh, that morning when Mohammed Atta and Abdul Aziz al Amari uh, walked through the Portland security with their box cutters and were able to get on the flight to go to Boston where they joined up with three other hijackers on American Airlines Flight 11. Uh, the airport security at that time was limited, it was basic, and it was insufficient. Uh, the, re the response to the attacks obviously was for uh, a number of things to happen, but in regards to, uh, to TSA, on November 19th, Congress passed a bill and the President signed a bill creating uh, the Transportation Security Administration, at that time part of the Department of Transportation. And so when we look at what the mandate was to the entire U.S. Defense community, intelligence, law enforcement, security apparatus, the, the president's mandate was don't let this happen again. And so over the course of the next year, TSA ramped up from, from zero uh, to, to nearly 50,000 employees. Um, is, is one of the greatest mass hirings, if you will, uh, in, in U.S. history in terms of a response to uh, an event such as 9-11. And what has happened since then is a refinement in some respects, an expansion in other respects of where uh, aviation security has focused. As Ozzie mentioned, obviously TSA has other responsibilities, 
uh, primarily as a force multiplier uh, to uh, state and local transit agencies and Amtrak, for example. So I won't comment on that at this point, but we've got to take your questions or comments on that. So that's where we were on 9-11. Uh, since then, obviously, much has changed, and, and the President's mandate at that time and continuing, obviously, in this administration is to not let that happen again. Uh, has held true. Uh, the, the challenge has become, as tariffs have evolved, how have we evolved and have we been able to stay uh, at least a step ahead of them in terms of their ingenuity, their creativity, their uh, ability to adapt and uh, de design, uh, conceal, uh, and deploy improvised explosive devices such as we saw whether on Richard Reed in December of 01, just a few months later, or as we saw with the liquids plot out of the UK in August of, of 06, uh, or as we saw with Abdul Matab on Christmas Day, and of course uh, the Yemen cargo plot last year, last October, where uh, the terrorists see what layers of security we, we have put in place and then modify their approach to try to ensure that they can get past our security. Of course, the latest intelligence now is about surgically implanted devices that suicide bombers would have, uh, so they would uh, not be, so we would not be able to, to detect the small devices such as Abdul Muttalib had um, on Christmas Day of 2009. Uh, we believe that we have been successful in pushing them to further extremes, if you will, in terms of their concealment and and their capabilities mindful that we need to ensure that we don't allow a repeat of a prior attack. So let's just look at some of the things that, that we have done uh, collectively since 9-11 when it comes to aviation security. If I asked uh, each of you uh, to write down some of those things, a number of things that I'm sure come to mind, most notably would be the checkpoint. Uh, the checkpoint that you must go through at one of the U.S.'s uh, 450 airports or, of course, around the world, uh, nearly 275 last points of departure that fly directly to the U.S. There are certain protocols, regimen that you have to go through which have, have become symbolic of the government's response uh, to 9-11. And with over 1.8 million people every day uh, traveling domestically, the, the TSA screens, uh, 12 and a half million a week, 50 million plus a month, over 625 million people every year and going up this year, you can see uh, the, the challenge that the men and women of TSA have to ensure they provide the most effective security in the most efficient way, providing the best uh, customer service, if you, if you will, but not at the expense of security. Uh, the bottom line is we have to make sure we're doing everything we can uh, while respecting privacy and civil liberties, a lot of debate about that, uh, as to uh, ensuring that another 9-11 doesn't happen. So, Think of the checkpoint um, and think of what happens there now instead of just a walk-through metal detector. That's still available, but there's also the advanced imaging technology, and I'm, I'm very pleased that, that we, the technology has developed that, and we are modifying uh, at least half of those, um, those scanners to what we call automatic target recognition. It just gives a generic outline of a person, um, and so in the next uh, 30 days or so, we should have half of all of those uh, machines, 450 or so around the country, um, uh, modified so it just gives that generic outline of person, and so it does not uh, do that more revealing uh, individual image. Um, contrary to what was, has been in the press quite a bit, at least the things I saw and were, of course, parodied on, on shows, it was not nearly as revealing as, as what was uh, depicted oftentimes. But the fact of the matter is there are privacy issues there that we're trying to be um, attuned to while making sure that we provide the best detection capability. Um, and so an Abdul Matalib, who perhaps is here in the U.S. inspired by al-Qaeda or some other terrorist group and has gone on the Internet, learned how to devise a device similar to that that is non-metallic, uh, that could get through a walk-through metal detector, that uh, that type of device will be picked up by, by the advanced imaging technology. That's one of the noticeable uh, changes. Obviously, we have explosive trace detection capabilities. So some of you have traveled. You may have your hands swabbed, for, uh, whether you're in, you're in line or if you alarm somehow, just have your hand swabbed for explosive trace detection. That's something, of course, we did not have. We have advanced technology x-ray now for the bags and a number of different iterations of that. But the bottom line is, as passengers pack more uh, 
uh, of their personal items in their carry-on bag so they don't have to pay a check bag fee. I'm sure none of you have done that here. Um, but as people do that, it makes detection, frankly, more difficult for the security officers who are looking at the screen. And if any of you have not had an opportunity uh, or have done that, uh, I would just, to see what these items look like, I would just uh, ask that you be patient with uh, those uh, security officers who are looking because it is very challenging to look for an organic mass and uh, an initiator. So the two things that we're looking for uh, in terms of an improvised explosive device and there's many things that look like either initiator or organic mass. And so the, the challenge is, uh, is how do we resolve those issues and those anomalies, if you will, um, in a timely way that provides, again, the most effective security, but in the most efficient way. So we have the advanced uh, technology x-ray. We have bottle liquid scanners. We're, we are working on um, technology to get to the point where we can allow liquids to come back on planes, but, but we're not there. Um, we've been working closely with the European Union in terms of some of, and the European Parliament's mandates to allow liquids back on planes by April 2013. The technology is not there yet, uh, but we're working on that and also some other risk-based security initiatives, which I'll talk about uh, in just a few minutes. And so uh, that's what's happening at the, at the checkpoint. What is not, what you do not see, hopefully, uh, because unless you're down in, in the cargo area, uh, is the inline baggage systems that we have uh, worked with industry to develop a high-speed process for screening of explosives, screening of, of checked bags for explosives. Obviously, pre-9-11, that didn't happen. Now, Pan Am 103 uh, did change the procedures for matching the person to the bag on international flights, but it did not require, no legislation was enacted to require that those bags then be screened for explosives. And so that's been a major development and a change. Again, you probably don't see, you shouldn't see uh, in most instances, but we have uh, millions of bags that we screen uh, every, every day, um, and uh, both from the, the checked bags and the carry-on bags to look for those explosives that could be catastrophic uh, to the aircraft. So that's something else that out, is out there. And then also behavior detection officers. I'll say they didn't exist on 9-11. You know, question is, if they'd been at Portland, Maine, or Boston, or Dulles, or Newark, would they have picked up on these individuals? Well, hopefully so. That's something we'll obviously never know. But the idea is to give us an, yet another opportunity in a, in a layered defense to identify, deter, and disrupt uh, terrorists who are bent on causing destruction. So how do we best go about doing that? It is through those layers of defenses that we have. That's all um, on the physical side of things. Where we are making significant progress is also on the technology intelligence side of things. And Secure Flight was just, is, is of course, uh, our system that just requires the name, date of birth, and gender of all travelers, uh, all those 1.8 million people every day, and it allows us to again do some definitive checking against the terrorist watch list. Of course, terrorist watch list pr prior to 9-11 uh, <laughs> were limited at best, and the idea of being able to check with any uh, confidence or, or any level of, of, um, of accuracy was quite limited, frankly, prior to last year, about now, last, talk, last October actually, is, um, full rollout of secure flight. Previously, airlines, maintained uh, list, and so we would not know, for example, if there were a uh, half dozen selectees or even some no-flies who were wanting to travel. If they're on different airlines, uh, we would not know that information, perhaps until the last minute, if at all. So the advent of Secure Flight was just recognized by the 9-11 Commission as being one of the, uh, the, the good technological, technology developments, and we use that from an intelligence-based perspective to say, we want to be a, a counterterrorism, risk-based intelligence-driven organization that is, is informed by the intelligence from the community. And this is one of those key enablers that allows us to do that. The other part I'll just touch on briefly is in cargo. Um, and again, going back to Pan Am 103, and we, we see what can happen with, with cargo that is, is not thoroughly screened. We see what happened with the Yemen cargo plot uh, from last October when there is some screening, but because of the, uh, the ability for terrorists 
Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula in particular to, to design and conceal those in such a way that even upon inspection, uh, they look like normal computer printers. Uh, and, and so that is, that is a challenge. But when we look at cargo, uh, I don't think um, people realize that there, is, there are millions of pounds uh, of cargo that fly in U.S. passenger planes every day. Um, over over nine and a half million pounds of, of cargo go on U.S. passenger planes. And so all that cargo is also screened for explosives and, um, and that's done through a partnership with the private sector. But the bottom line is TSA has that responsibility. Again, that's something you don't see, but it's another layer of security that we're trying to ensure that you and your loved ones are safe, even if it's cargo, vice, uh, check bags or anything else a person may have on them. Now that uh, nine and a half million pounds, that's uh, just a little more than 10% of all the cargo that is screened and uplifted in the U.S. every day for both domestic and overseas locations. So it's not an insignificant amount, and it is something that, that is, is required for us to give the highest level of confidence that we are doing everything we can with the best uh, training techniques and tactics enab enabled by the best technology to provide that highest level of security, recognizing that uh, as we move forward, there's no guarantees in this business. So let me transition from where we were on 9-11 to what we've been doing the last 10 years to the way forward. And whether it's the next 10 days, weeks, months, or years, there's a lot of work that is being done to pr tr try to provide that most effective security in the most efficient way. And the one uh, part of that is recognizing that in order to give a 100% guarantee of safety and security for each and every passenger flight and cargo flight uh, would require a paradigm shift of what we're doing now to even more stringent uh, security measures, uh, both with passengers and with cargo, which would frankly um, inhibit the free movement of goods and, and people uh, with the best security um, in significant ways. And we saw that after the Yemen cargo plot. Uh, we had meetings. Uh, I met with the, the head of the World Customs Organization, the, uh, the head of the Universal Postal Union, who, of course, is affected by any time cargo is, uh, the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, and then um, the International Maritime Organization, to work with them to find a business-based model that would provide the most effective security without unduly restricting the global supply chain. Uh, because that's what's happened when we put an immediate uh, cargo ban hold on anything coming out of Yemen. The ripple effect, the impact of that was significant. And so in working with industry, we have been heartened by industry's own risk mitigation, risk management strategies, particularly here in the U.S., to buy down that risk of somebody putting a, something in cargo that could cause catastrophic failure um, and they're doing that without government regulation. So they're taking their own risk mitigation, risk management steps, again, recognizing that they are not in the risk elimination business just as we are not in the risk elimination business. We do what we can to mitigate and to manage risk. And so it's with that construct that we have been working uh, really uh, for the better part of a year now on what we call risk-based security initiative, uh, RBS initiative, which encompasses a number of different things, some of, the, of which you've heard about and some we have not talked about publicly yet, but uh, will uh, later this fall or, or next year. Some of the ones that are known are, for example, what we're doing in terms of identity-based screening for pilots, those in charge of the aircraft. Um, I worked the Egypt Air 990 crash uh, when I was with the FBI in Boston in 1999 where we did the salvage operation with the Navy and others trying to find evidence of what brought down that crash killing 231 people. And it wasn't until later that, that we realized uh, that it was um, not because of, of catastrophic failure. It was because of individual on board who got control, you know, co-pilot, and, and put the aircraft down. Um, that uh, was a stark reminder when I took over this job that no amount of physical screening is going to detect what's in a person's head. Um, and so it, it made little sense to me that, that we should require pilots who are literally in charge of the aircraft to go through screening when, if they had a prohibited item on them, whether it's a small knife or whatever it may be, that's not it's going to be what causes failure to an aircraft. It's what's in their, what's in their mind. Um, so that's one example. 
Uh, we are working with, uh, with industry, both the, the airlines, uh, the airports, and the travel associations to have a, a known trusted traveler um, expansion of what Customs Border Protection does with their global entry, century, and, and nexus networks where people pay a fee, go through an application process, have a background done, and so we have a higher level of confidence in who those pe people are because we know more about them. Again, not a guarantee, uh, but, but we know more about them. That's critical because under this risk-based security initiative, the whole idea is to focus on those that we know the least about or the most about because they're on a terrorist watch list and then be able to focus our limited resources on those individuals and then to uh, enable us to do that, we need to do something else in terms of more intelligence screening on the front end and, and then we can expedite those who we know a lot about. There's a number of you in, this, in the audience who, who have a, um, a security clearance, secret, top secret. Um, the question is, uh, we know a lot, lot about you, you're in a trusted position, should you have to go through the same type of screening as somebody without? And that's just a, an example. Again, no, uh, nothing dispositive there in terms of risk, um, but it, it does give us an opportunity with all our other layers of security in place to try to make some advances in that regard. Uh, with working with the airlines, as I mentioned, we are hoping um, next month to do some, some proof of concepts in at least four airports with frequent flyers um, at, at uh, higher elite levels, uh, starting off anyway, who are willing to share information about themselves through their airline to say, yes, I, I uh, am willing to share that I am a frequent flyer. And as we look at travel histories and things later on, we'll be able to make even more formed, informed judgments as to what risk this person poses. If you've been flying for 20, 25, 30 years, um, and you are at this level um, for all those years or many part of those years, it's possible you're a terrorist, um, but it's not likely. And so as we can, again, use more intelligence to shape and inform our judgments and decisions, I think we can make a, a better process of, again, the most effective security in the most efficient way. We're also looking at ways that we can uh, streamline the screening of children, recognizing the children aren't terrorists, but unfortunately we know that people do use them uh, to do bad things. And we have several examples of children 10 and under from around the world. Nothing involved in aviation, but, uh, but we're mindful that terrorists are always looking to exploit societal norms and mores, if you will, to, to try to cause us harm number of different uh, ways that we are looking at this risk-based security initiative. The bottom line, again, is to use more intelligence on the front end, and Secure Flight enables us to do that in many ways, to embed information on the boarding pass in, in conjunction with the airlines and to allow us to focus in that way. So there has also been talk about a checkpoint of the future, uh, the International Air Travel Association. Uh, IATA has, has been a strong proponent of that. Uh, I am also a proponent of that. The technology, again, is, is not there, but the idea is that uh, you could actually just walk through, without divesting anything, uh, walk through uh, security scanners, which would pick up uh, explosives or anything else that may be uh, cause catastrophic failure to an aircraft. That's a great idea, and um, working, uh, that's something that is being explored, but again, the technology is not there to do that. Uh, so all these opportunities we have to try to shift the paradigm from the one-size-fits-all construct to try to tailor the security screening uh, involving intelligence, involving physical screening, involving random and unpredictable, because we will always maintain that. There will be no guarantees in this uh, risk-based security initiative. Uh, I, I simply refuse to allow terrorists to, to game the system, to say, okay, if I build this legend of travel or whatever it is, then I'm guaranteed uh, extradited screening. We'll always maintain that random and unpredictable aspect of it to ensure that we are doing the, the best possible job. So with that, let me thank you for your time and attention this morning. Look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, for those comments.
Um, we're going to do the question and answer period now. But before, I, I was remiss when I when I introduced Administrator Pistol. I think one of his greatest achievements, especially considering today's political climate, was the fact that he was confirmed by unanimous consent in the Senate. Um, so in TSA, and to get that after all the controversies and everything, again, is a is a testament to the, to the kind of uh, leader that TSA currently has. Um, so with that, let's go to questions and answers. Please wait for the microphones to come around because we do have media and they're trying to capture these. State your name, uh, your affiliation if you have one, and a question, no statements. I will ask you to sit down. Um, so who wants to be first? The gentleman in the red shirt right over here. Thank you. John Brandt, Fox News Channel. Um, with respect to the Christmas Day underwear bomber, is it accurate to say that um, we were lucky that the explosives didn't ignite because his pants were damp? And more broadly, is it safe, is it fair to say that we get lucky more than lucky that more of these plots don't succeed? Succeed, excuse me. Thank you. There are a number of unknowns, of course. We, I, I think we were fortunate on Christmas Day. Um, the question I, I would uh, ref look back at is, is what have our layers of security done to uh, force, if you will, terrorists to adopt different means of concealment? And so whether there was something either in the design, construction, or the fact that he'd been traveling for 17, 18 hours, did that have something to do with it? Uh, there are a lot of unknowns. The bottom line is, if it had detonated as as intended, it would have likely uh, caused catastrophic failure to the aircraft. Great, thank you. Uh, gentleman over here on the right-hand side, please. Uh, thanks, I'm Tony Feinberg from the Institute for Defense Analyses. Uh, along the lines of risk-based uh, approaches to security, uh, you uh, made allusion to four incidents that occurred since 9-11, all of which were on inbound flights from other countries into here. Would not a risk-based uh, uh, system emphasize far more and put far more resources on inbound flights than it does on domestic flights? Part of our challenge, obviously, is how we assure with the highest level of confidence that our international partners are doing requisite screening to our levels. And so we work very closely with uh, both our counterparts, but also with the security services, um, the law enforcement intelligence uh, community agencies, and, and the governments, and the, um, the, the airlines and, and airport authorities in those last points of departure particularly to ensure that they are doing uh, that requisite, uh, at least baseline security. And then as we inform through information sharing, uh, additional information such as the um, uh, information gleaned after the Christmas Day attack, the Yemen cargo plot, and, and so forth, um, we look at those opportunities. The risk-based security initiative that we are working on is designed to start here domestically to s make sure that we can get it right here. And then uh, we've been in dialogue with a number of foreign governments and, and uh, private industry who are very much interested in how this works and then ex for us expanding that to those flights that would be impacted um, internationally. But, but we're focused first domestically. All right, thank you for that question. Uh, gentleman over here in the blue suit, please. Hi, good morning. Mike Goldman for Silverberg, Goldman & Bikoff. You talked a little bit about um, cargo on passenger carrying aircraft. The uh, question is, is all cargo on inbound international passenger carrying aircraft now being screened, recognizing that screening may entail more than just uh, x-raying, but there are some other techniques that you have available? Thank you. Right now, 100% of all the high-risk cargo is being screened inbound to the U.S. We don't define that publicly because we don't, again, want to provide a roadmap to the terrorists, say, okay, if we can just get out of that high-risk category. But it really falls within two constructs. One is known shippers and known shipments. And so if there is an existing relationship with a shipper um, and uh, that has been existing for a certain amount of time and, and we know the products they shipped, whether it's Fortune 500 companies or whomever, uh, that's one of aspects. The other, if it's not in that category, is it a known shipment? And so let's just use the Yemen cargo plot as an example. The fact that uh, a young woman dropped off two computer printers with clothes and books uh, and was paying approximately $500 to send those two packages by different aircraft to Chicago, that doesn't make much sense from an intelligence, from a risk-based security perspective. 
So it's that type of information, advanced cargo information is very, very helpful in defining who's a known shipper or a known shipment. So again, without going into too much detail, that's a general construct. Right, who do we have uh, next question? No, okay, gentlemen, right here, the blue shirt. Good morning, Justin Arbona, uh, just a private citizen. Um, question on the on the um, the RBS, the uh, risk based security. Uh, it seems like you're kind of talking about profiling, but without really saying the word. How are we going to socialize the American people to accept that? And and second part, if I may, sir, is uh, are we are we taking any of the, the Israeli uh, Israeli Airlines um, lessons learned and practices into our own practice? Well, first let me say, you're not just a, a, an American citizen, you're who we're working for. So look, it's the men and women of TSA who are working every day to keep you and your loved ones safe. Um, and so what we uh, are, are trying to do is, is uh, frankly, um, um, under promise and over deliver in terms of, of how we can do this in an iterative process. So I mentioned the pilots, to me that's common sense. Um, we also have worked with the World War II veterans who come into to D.C. to see the World War II Memorial on charter flights and to work with them to do more of an identity-based screening uh, as opposed to you know, the typical physical screening. Now, there's a chance that one of these elderly gentlemen, um, who the youngest is in his late 80s, uh, is a terrorist, but it's not likely. So how can we just employ some more common sense in the policies that, that we use? Um, the socialization and the acceptance by the American people um, is, is critical from the standpoint of, of making it viable. So if our, our groups who are trusted or known um, are such a small group, then, then that won't make much difference to the 1.8 million people traveling every day. So what we are working with, again, through the airlines and through uh, some outreach is just saying, if it's all voluntary, if you don't want to share any information about yourself, that's fine. You'll just go through the normal screening protocols. But if you like the possibility, if not the probability, of expedited physical screening and you're willing to share information about yourself, then we're interested in that and how we can use that in a, in a constructive way uh, to, to do the best possible security in the most efficient way. Next question. That's right here in the back, left-hand side. Microphone's coming around. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Pistola, what is your vision, uh, you know, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the, the future of this uh, process? Uh, you know that we in this country, many people are quite upset about the extensive uh, process that goes on. And what do you foresee that we could evolve into with respect to our, you know, end game in terms of being going through the process of, of, of uh, screening? Sir, could you state your name and your affiliation? Dan quick? Gibbons, uh, Georgetown. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. the, the whole I idea is, again, to if we use the needle in the haystack uh, analogy, so we're looking for that uh, one in a billion or whatever it may be. For example, since Richard Reed, December uh, of, of 01, we've had nearly 6 billion people uh, travel in the U.S. That, that TSA has screened. Obviously, we didn't start screening until in 02. Um, and there have been no shoe bombs, and s simply from a, a probability standpoint, um, that's something that we are interested in, in looking at. What does intelligence tell us? Have shoe bombs been used around the world? No, they haven't, even though the EU uh, has that many people traveling, there's 27 countries of the EU traveling in that same time frame. So it's using intelligence in an informed way. Uh, the end state, I think, will always be evolving. So I, I don't think it's reasonable for anybody to say, you know, two-year plan, three-year plan, five-year plan, ten-year plan, say this is exactly what it's going to look at because we're, we are always evolving, um, again, hopefully ahead of the terrorists as they evolve. But the general uh, approach is to provide more intelligence screening on the front end, to expedite the physical screening in as many opportunities as we can so that we reduce the size of that haystack so that needle that we're looking for is smaller than what we started with under our previous one-size-fits-all construct. Yeah, Mark in the front row. Thank you. Uh, Mark Frey, Steptone Johnson. Uh, to go back to the trusted traveler expedited screening, I was wondering if you had a sense yet of what that expedited screening 
is. Um, and I know there's going to be randomness and unpredictability, but you know, for global entry, for example, you get a specific tangible benefit. You go to a kiosk, you don't have to wait in the line. Can we expect maybe we don't have to take off our shoes? Uh, maybe we get to carry a bottle of water on. Is there a, what's your thoughts about what the average traveler will get? Thank you. What we are doing in the proof of concept in, in four airports starting uh, next month is the really three things. One, a dedicated lane for them so you don't stand in the regular lane. Two, you do get to keep your shoes on. And then three, uh, you can keep your laptop in your briefcase or, or carrying case. So those are the three tangible benefits that we are uh, looking at. Again, you may, um, you may end up, you may do that nine times. You're a 1K or 2K flyer, uh, but you, and you may, the last nine times, you may have gone through that dedicated lane tenth time you may end up going through regular screening simply for random and unpredictable ah, yes right here in the middle black dress hi I'm Caitlin Garman with BAE systems can you please comment as to whether possible budget cuts would affect T TSA especially when it comes to personnel Well, we're very mindful, again, that we work for the taxpayers, and uh, there's a lot of focus on how every government agency can be more efficient. So the bottom line is that we don't have a diminution of security uh, at, because of budget cuts. So, so I, as administrator, have to look at a 60,000-person pers organization and say, how can we achieve efficiencies uh, in a way that, that does not adversely affect security? And so. For the last six months or so, we've been going through a series of reviews, internal reviews and exercises to identify some of those areas that we can be more efficient while not negatively impacting security. I'm going to jump in here with, with a, one question. Um, we talk a lot about, um, I mean, obviously, your TSA is on the front lines interacting with the general population on a daily basis throughout the entire transportation system, and there's a lot that's asked of TSA, but um, I'll put you on the spot and say, what, what can TSA, what do you need from the American people? What can they do to help improve the transportation security system? Well, at the, uh, at the risk of misquoting a, um, a, a president in, in a different way, but I think it was President Jefferson um, who talked about an informed electorate being the best defense uh, of democracy. For, for us, the, uh, a well-informed traveler is, is the, the best defense against um, a terrorist because, one, it's somebody who knows how to prepare for security screening, so it's that partnership. But two, they'll be attuned to things that don't seem right. So the whole, if you see something, say something campaign is particularly for those who are frequent travelers who recognize when somebody's not being what what they should be or whatever. And and so so it's that partnership that I would say is critical for us. And then um, frankly, be patient with us as we roll out some of these risk-based security initiatives that uh, we'll need time uh, to make sure that, that we get it right and we may need to recalibrate and go back and do things. We're doing a uh, behavior assessment, um, an assessor program at Boston Logan now, and, and some of you may have been uh, through that, where it's just a brief interview. But I just ask for uh, patience and cooperation as, again, the bottom line is to make sure another 9-11 doesn't happen or something else where they come up with a creative scheme that um, that just hasn't been identified. Great, thank you. Uh, another question from the audience. Gentleman front row here. Paul Ryan, Whitney Bradley and Brown Consulting. Uh, in your opening remarks, you, you mentioned Amtrak is no by the way. Um, if you think about the European terrorist bombings over the last several years, they're all seem to be train or subway oriented. Um, if you go to Union Station, you see some policemen walking around dogs. If you get on the train in New London, Connecticut, you buy your ticket at a kiosk, you get on the train, there's no inspection, nothing obvious. Um, are, are we taking enough actions or, you know, or is the, the train transportation system kind of the soft underbelly we're not uh, paying enough attention to? Yeah, so a couple of points. I, I, I uh, didn't mean to give short shrift to just the focus of today's aviation security, so I'd be glad to talk in detail about it. But uh, clearly, terrorists see subways, passenger trains, some freight trains around the world as vulnerable because of the open architecture that you describe. 
Uh, that being said, uh, one, one of the things in TSA that we do is recognize we can't be all things to all people, all places at all times. So how can we leverage our resources in a smart, efficient way to augment or enhance what, whether it's the Amtrak police or the Metropolitan uh, Transit Authorities uh, of the major systems around the country? Uh, and you just look at the ridership. I mean, you're, you're you know, 8 million plus every day um, around the country on subways and things. So vastly greater numbers. Again, that's where the, I think the random and unpredictable comes in. Amtrak, Chief O'Connor does a great job in terms of having uniform patrols, canines, random bag searches, things that, again, are, are designed to throw off the terrorists. We know from debriefings of, of terrorists who have cooperated that the three things that they focus on uh, as a deterrent are uniformed officers, canine, and CCTV. The last one being only if they're not planning to be a suicide bomber. So Madrid bombings in 04, obviously they left the packages and, and got out. The 7-7 the seven, seven bombers in London in, in 05, uh, one of them as they were walking down into the tube looked at the CCTV because frankly he didn't care. In 10 minutes he was going to be dead and as many people with him that he could kill. So, so those are things we have the visible intermodal pr protection response teams, Viper teams that are designed to do just that, provide that uh, unpredictable um, uh, posture, but recognizing that uh, there are challenges that uh, are are significant every day, and and that it's through that partnership with the American people. There's um, Paul McMillan, the the Metro Transit chief in in Boston, has done some creative things on the See Something Say Something campaign, taking for example a a, a ten foot uh, backpack, if you will, and and putting it out by different uh, MBTA stops. And it says something like, uh, it won't always be this obvious. So just the idea that, uh, or our huge package, like a FedEx or UPS package, you know, a huge one, bigger than this table, again, it won't be usually this obvious. And so what can we do in terms of being informed and responsive? So not just enough to be informed, but be responsive to address those challenges. Yeah, good question. Thanks. Next question. Uh, woman in the back, please. Hi, good morning. Eliana Mintz, Talk Radio News Service. Um, I was Thank you for sharing all this enhanced security measures that TSA has implemented, but I'm curious as to whether we really are safer. I travel regularly, and to be perfectly honest, I get shavers and liquids through regularly. So I was wondering, how do we know terrorists aren't doing the same? The bottom line is, yes, I, I think the Clearly, the consensus is, and I strongly believe that we are safer today than we were. Uh, but we recognize again, it's it's not a perfect system. Uh, it's not a 100% guarantee. Both the uh, Government Accountability Office, the DHS uh, Inspector General's Office, and our own TSA Office of Inspection does covert red team testing um, to try to get things through a checkpoint, and have had successes, um, a number of successes. Um, and that coupled with the intelligence we know about how terrorists are trying to conceal devices such as uh, Abdul Matab on Christmas Day, um, that uh, presents the challenges that we say, let's make sure that we are looking at those items that can be catastrophic damage to an aircraft. So that's why I mentioned the organic mass and the, the, uh, the initiator of an IED. Those are the, the two key things that we're looking for because you've got to have something uh, that some type of explosive, whether it's liquid. Now, now, hopefully, you're not when you say you're taking liquids on. You're not. You've got a 16 ounce or a pint or liter bottle of something you're taking through. Hopefully, smaller size. Um, but part of it is simply how do we best uh, position our resources to identify those threats which may be catastrophic. There'll be a law enforcement officer in the back after the. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Anyone else? All right, going once, going twice. Okay, uh, Administrator Pistol, I want to thank you once again. I know this is a very busy week for you, um, and we really appreciate your time, appreciate your leadership at the uh, TSA, and uh, thank you very much for coming to CSIS. Thank you.